Timothy. All right, let's take our Bibles. Haggai chapter 1. Let's go ahead and stand and read. And by the way, this is for everybody in the church, not one specific person. But when we give testimonies in our church, I want you to do two things. Number one, I want you to stand. I want you to talk loud so everybody can hear you. And the first thing I want you all to say is, I praise the Lord for my salvation. And then give your testimony, all right? So let's work on that together. Haggai chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 1. We'll read all the way to the end of the chapter, 15 verses. I'll read somewhat fast, so pay close attention, all right? The Bible says this. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house waste, lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? saith the Lord of hosts. Because of, mine, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from the dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the high ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Joshadek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the fourth and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. I want you to look at two verses. Uh, the first thing I want you to look at is in verse number 5 where the Bible says, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And then drop down to verse number 7, almost the identical verse where the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And for just a few moments, I want to preach a message with this thought in mind on considering your ways. Consider your ways. Let's pray and we'll get right into the message this evening. Father, once again, we come to you and praise you for all that you've done and all that you are. I pray that you'd help us now as we've opened up your word. I pray for your blessings upon the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that you'd open up our hearts now to receive your word. Lord, help me, I pray, to say what needs to be said, nothing more, nothing less. Help me to say it in a spirit that honors you and that pleases you and will be mindful for it all to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. I remember when I was in Bible college and taking a number of classes and different courses on the Bible that in a couple of those classes, I was required to memorize a number sequence to help me kind of understand how the Old Testament is broken down in categories. And here was the number sequence that was used so that I could understand it a little bit better. It was 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. And I don't think I could ever forget that if I wanted to. And basically, uh, that, that number sequence is a way that you can kind of categorize the books of the Old Testament. For instance, we know that the first 
five books of the Old Testament are the books of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. We know that the second set of books, the 12 books of history, five and then 12, the 12 books of uh, of, of uh, 1 Samuel to Esther, those are historical books, and so we call those books of history. And then when we come to the third section, uh, five books of poetry, and that's Job uh, through Song of Solomon, and then we come to the five major prophets, and that's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And so those are the major prophets of the Bible, and they're not major because of its message, they're called major because of the size of the books. And then the last series of numbers, uh, the last 12 books of the Old Testament, are known for being the books of the minor prophets. And that's the books of Hosea all the way through the book of Malachi. And here's the thing about the minor prophets. And again, let me just reiterate the fact that they're not minor because of its message. So I hope nobody here thinks that the minor prophets have a minor message Every book of the Bible has a major message found within its pages. But the reason why they're called minor is because they're, they're small books, and most of them just have a few chapters. And here in the book of Haggai, it only has two chapters. And here's the thing about the minor prophets, all right? The first nine of those 12 books are books that record the preaching of the prophets before or during the captivity, okay? So, so these men were preaching to the nation of Judah right before or during their captivity experience. Now, the interesting thing about the book of Haggai is that Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last three books of the Minor Prophets, or the last three books of the New Testament, are, are books that record the preaching of the prophets after the captivity. Okay, so you have some prophets that preached before uh, Judah went into captivity. You have some prophets that preached during captivity, but these three prophets were those who preached after the captivity. Now that's very, very important because if we look at the book of Haggai, we have to ask ourselves, what is this book all about? What's taking place in this past of Scripture? Well, to have an understanding of our Old Testament history helps us to understand exactly uh, what is taking place in, in, in Haggai, and it gives us a, an appreciation for the significance of this book. Most of you know the history of the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, and most of you know this, that in the year 722 B.C., the northern kingdom of the nation of Israel was taken captive by what world empire at that time? Does anybody know? Assyria, that's right. And then we find that pretty much those ten northern tribes were lost. I don't believe they were technically lost, but uh, you don't really read a whole lot about the tribes after the Assyrian invasion. And then later on, in the year 605, uh, 597, and 586 B.C., the Babylonians came down against the nation of Judah and three times they besieged the city of Jerusalem and in 586 B.C. they pretty much took all of the nation of Judah away captive. They left some of the poor, they left some of the stragglers, uh, but pretty much the entire nation of Judah was taken back into, captive, uh, into captivity to the Babylonians. Now somebody answer me this question. When the Babylonians took Judah captive, how long was the captivity? Does anybody remember? Yeah, just say it out, Brother Paul. Brother Doug beat you, but I know that I know that you knew the answer before he did, all right? Seventy years. Seventy years. And the Bible tells us about uh, this invasion that took place. You can read about it in Second Chronicles chapter 34 through 36 and Second Kings chapter number 25. And uh, we read in Jeremiah chapter 25 that Jeremiah prophesied that the people of Judah would be in captivity. And Jeremiah basically told them, look, you better just settle down. You better get used to being in Babylon because you're going to be a captive for 70 years. And so for 70 years, the people of Judah dwelled in the land of Babylon. Uh, they dwelled hundreds of miles away from their homeland. And uh, uh, you remember that for 70 years they weren't allowed to return to their land until something happened. 
And some of you might remember what happened, but you remember that a new world empire came on the scene. Does anybody remember who that world empire was? Persia, that's exactly right. And I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter number 36 because I want you to see what is taking place that caused the people of Judah to come back to their homeland. Seventy years has gone by. Their land has been desolated. Their temple has been destroyed. You read about in, uh, in the books of Jeremiah, or excuse me, you read in the books of Lamentations, and uh, you read how Jeremiah was weeping and lamenting over the condition of his people, and all of the rubble and the ashes were spread across the land, and the, the utter chaos that had been caused by the people of Babylon. Well, look what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter number 36, all right? And look at verse number 22, and when you get there, say amen. All right, now notice what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 22. The Bible says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me, now notice, to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. So about 70 years has gone by and now there's a new empire on the scene and Cyrus is the king and it's about 535 B.C., 536 B.C., somewhere in that area. And now King Cyrus has made a proclamation that any of the captives that came from Judah that were in Babylon, now that there's a new power uh, 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 in place, if any of those Jews want to go back to their homeland and work on rebuilding their temple, they're welcomed to go. Now look at Ezra chapter 1, look at verse number 1 through 4, and notice what happens. Notice what the Bible says. Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up by the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him and house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, for he is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, and with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, beside the free will offering of the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So here again in Ezra, Ezra begins to record uh, the time where the people of Judah are able to go back to their land and Cyrus has now proclaimed that if you want to go and build the temple, you're free to go. And if you don't want to go, send money with these people and help finance the work so that they can rebuild the temple that was destroyed. Well, this sounds great. I mean, for the nation of Israel, this sounds wonderful. It sounds like God is working and stirring up the heart of King Cyrus and the people are going to go back and do a great work for God. All is good, right? Well, not really. Because the truth of the matter is, is that there was a problem. Only a handful of people, in comparison to how many captives were in Babylon, only a handful of Jews wanted to go back and rebuild the temple. In fact, only a remnant wanted to return. This is actually pretty sad because this is a dangerous uh, uh, thing for the nation of Israel. And by the way, the same problem that Israel struggled with is the same problem that we often struggle with. And you know what that problem is? Complacency. 
Because Israel had kind of settled down in the land of Babylon. Many of them had businesses and many of them uh, had, uh, uh, they had positions of, of stature and many of them were, were, were people who had grown accustomed to the ways of, of Babylon and to the ways of these Gentiles people. But this is an important time for the nation of Israel because think about what was at stake. The existence of their nation was at stake. I mean, if Israel doesn't come rebuild the temple, their existence is in jeopardy. They could become like their sister nation Israel who had become almost lost. And so here in this passage of Scripture, only a small few are willing to come back. Turn over to Ezra chapter number 2. And in Ezra chapter number 2, the number is given to us of how many Jews came back to rebuild the temple. Look at verse number 64 of Ezra chapter number 2. The Bible says the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,304 score. So the Bible says right here in verse 64 that 42,360, now look at verse number 65, beside their servants and their maids of whom there were 7,337, and there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. So the Bible gives us three numbers. It gives us 42,360, 7,337, uh, 7, and then 200, which comes out to what, Miss Joanne? <laughs> I just bet you, she, you know, I always ask her stuff like she said, don't ask me. 49,897. 49,897. Now you might be thinking, wow, that, that's a great number. Not really. Not in comparison to how many should have come back. And so we find here that almost 50,000 people come back and they come back under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Now wait a second. The book of Ezra primarily or largely records the return of these 50,000 Israelites coming back to the land of Judah and rebuilding their temple under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Now wait a second. If, if Zerubbabel is the main character, why isn't the book called Ez, uh, Zerubbabel? You see, the fact of the matter is, is that Ezra comes on a little bit later uh, in the book. In fact, it was 78 years after the first group came back to the land of Judah and uh, 50 years after the temple was built. And so Zerubbabel with other men go back to the land of Judah with 50,000 people to rebuild the temple. Now fast forward in the book. Go to Ezra chapter number 3. And I'm not going to read these verses. But I, I want to just go over them very quickly. In Ezra chapter 3 verses 1 through 7, we find that Zerubbabel and these other leaders make it back to the land of Judah. They come into the city of Jerusalem and they have their 50,000 people, roughly 50,000 people with them. And the very first thing that they do is that they rebuilt the altar that was broken down. That's a good place to start. You know, some of us right now, we need to rebuild some altars in our homes. Some of us right now, we need to rebuild that prayer altar or perhaps we need to rebuild that, that holiness altar, that altar of sanctification. Whatever the case might be, we find that the very first thing that Zerubbabel did for the welfare of his people, for the welfare of the spiritual condition of his people, is that he rebuilt the altar of the Lord. And so in verse number 1 to verse number 7 of chapter 3, the religious worship is established, and so they've come to the land, and they've rebuilt the, uh, the altar, and, and, and notice what it says in verse number 12. It says this, But many of the priests and the Levites of the chief fathers who were of the ancient men had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. So the first thing that they do when they get back to Judah is that they rebuild the altar. The second thing that they do is that they lay the foundation for the temple. Now, when you come to chapter number 3, everything seems to be going well. 
Man, the people are excited. In fact, read in verse number 12, the Bible says that many of the people that were there shouted aloud for joy. There were other men, the older men, the ancient of men, they wept because they remember what it was like to be under Solomon's temple and they remember how big and magnificent and beautiful that temple was and this new temple that was going up could not compare to the beauty and could not compare to the size of Solomon's temple. So they were a little bit discouraged, but the young men that were there, they began to shout for joy because the work of God is going forward and boy you read Ezra chapter 1 through 3 and it seems like man things are going well and you can't help but get a little bit excited for the people of God well something happens in chapter number 4 look what it says the very first verse of chapter 4 now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord God of Israel they came to Zerubbabel you know what happened we find that after they get back to the land and they begin to work and they reinstitute this altar and they lay the foundation that adversaries came their way. That opposition confronted them. And I just want to remind everybody, and this is not the message, I'm trying to work to get to the book of Haggai, but I just want us to know and I just want us to be reminded of the fact that no good work goes unchallenged. And if you're ever going to do anything for God, listen, wives, if you're going to be a godly wife, husbands, if you're going to be a godly husband, if you're going to be a provider, if you're going to do all that God has called you to do, if we're going to have a great church, a church that influences people and sees people saved, if we're going to move forward for God, you better mark it down that no good work goes unchallenged. We were talking about it just a moment ago that revival is coming up and I'm looking forward to having revival and Brother Samson coming to preach and uh, you just count on it. It's going to happen. Uh, that week, someone in here is going to get a flat tire. Thank God I got mine out of the way, amen? You mark it down, there's going to be something in your home that's going to uh, cause you and husband or husband and wife to fight and to nag against one another. Uh, you mark it down, uh, little things are going to uh, just gnaw at you and eat at you to try to ruin your joy. Why? Because Satan is going to work to try to hinder God's work from being accomplished. And so there was opposition to these people. And I, I, I don't want to preach the book of Ezra, but the opposition was so bad that they wrote a letter to King Artaxerxes, who was in Persia at this time, and they told King Artaxerxes that if you let these people rebuild this temple and reestablish their presence in this land, that they will ultimately rebel against you and insurrect and cause all kinds of trouble. And so you read in verse number 17 down to verse number 24, and you're going to find that the work in Jerusalem stops. Uh, let me just read in verse number 21. I want you to see what happens in Ezra chapter 4, verse number 21. Notice what it says, Give ye now commandment to cause these men to cease, that this city be not builded unto another commandment, shall be given from me. Take heed. Now that ye fail not to do this, why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? So, do you know what takes place as a result of this bitter opposition? These adversaries caused the work of God to hinder and the work of God to stop. Now, go to chapter number 5 for just a moment, all right? Now look, here's, here's what I, I need you to do, all right? I need you to go back to Haggai and hold your place because I want you to flip back. Haggai chapter number 1, and I want you to see something in Haggai chapter 1, all right? Now look what it says in verse number 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto, who does it say? Zerubbabel. So the message of Haggai is given to who? To Zerubbabel. Well, where do we read about Zerubbabel? Well, we read about Zerubbabel here in Ezra chapter 1 through 4. Now look in chapter number 5 of Ezra. Hold your place in Haggai because we're going right back to it. But here's what I want you to notice. Now look. Between Ezra 4 and Ezra 5, there's a 15-year period in between those two chapters. Okay? So for 15 years, 
The men didn't pick up a hammer. The men didn't pick up a chisel. They had laid the foundation and the temple was ready. The walls were ready to go up. They reinstituted the altar. They laid down the temple. But now I want you to kind of imagine that altar. I want you to imagine shrubs that are coming up in that foundation. I want you to imagine uh, uh, trees and maybe some animals have made their dens and made their uh, nest in some of the rocks that, that were there on the foundation. I mean, here is the house of God. The temple is the place of worship. And the Jews had the responsibility of coming back and rebuilding that temple. But for 15 years, all the work has been suspended and all the work has stopped. Well, when we come to chapter number 5, Haggai, if you're wanting to read chronologically, Haggai ought to be read right before you read chapter number 5. Because something happens in between chapter 4 and chapter 5 that causes, notice what it says in verse number 2, Ezra chapter 5 and verse number 2, look what it says. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and began to build up the house of God which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. So verse number 2 tells us something very interesting. Fifteen years has gone by and nobody has lifted a finger, and the temple of the Lord has, uh, the work of the temple of the Lord has halted, but something has taken place after fifteen years that now we see Zerubbabel has risen up, and mighty men with him, prophets with him, and they begin to resume the work of God in which they quit 15 years ago. What in the world happened to cause them to get back to work? You know what happened? Look at verse number 1 of Ezra chapter 5. Here's what happened. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Do you know what caused the work to move forward? What caused the work to move forward was the preaching of Haggai and the preaching of Zechariah. Well, what was it about the message of Haggai? What did Haggai say? What did Haggai do to cause these men to leave 15 years of laziness and complacency and, and 15 years of apathy? What caused uh, these men to rise up and rebuild a work that they started 15 years prior, what was it about Haggai's message? Well, we don't have to wonder because God wrote all of it down for us in Haggai chapter number 1. Go back for just a moment to Haggai chapter 1 and let me give you just a couple of thoughts here about what Haggai said to motivate the people of God from their apathy and their complacency to get their attention so that they could get the work of God. Notice what Haggai had commanded them to do. Haggai preached to turn their attention of their own selfish interest and their own selfish desires to the interest of God. Now notice what it says here in verse number 2. Notice in verse number 2, God gives us the attitude of the people. Notice what the attitude of the people was who returned to the land of Israel. It says this, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, The people say. So here's what God says about the people. God says, The people say, The time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Do you know what God says concerning the people of Judah? Do you know that God not only sees our actions, but God knows our hearts? And God not only sees our hearts, but He knows our thoughts. And nothing could be kept secret from the Lord. And the Lord begins to put His finger right down on the impulse of the hearts of the people of Judah. And God says, I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is, is that you have an attitude in which you are saying that it's not a good time to work. You know what the people were filled with? The people were filled with excuses. God is saying, look, Haggai, the problem with the people for 15 years, it's not because the king has ordered us to stop. No, the people have uh, stopped the work because they have all kinds of excuses as to why they shouldn't work. Now look, 
I, I'm as good as anybody else, I reckon, but we have excuses for just about anything, don't we? But we don't have excuses when the ball game's on, do we? And we don't have excuses when it's time to do our favorite recreational activity. And we don't have excuses when it's time to have fun in the sun. But when it comes to the work of God, we find excuses to get us out from doing the things that God wants us to do. Isn't that right? You know, we have a church of about 70, 80 people. I mean, probably a little bit larger than that of everybody who's identified with our church. And it's amazing to me that only a handful of people do any kind of corporate activity and going out and try to see people saved and witness to folks and put gospel tracts on people's door and try to confront people about their salvation. And I'm not saying that people don't do it at work and when there are other places, but it's hard for me to believe that only just a handful of people want to come out on a Saturday morning to try to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Something is wrong with that number. And here's the problem. The problem is, is that we have an excuse for everything, do we not? Man, my hand is there. And I've made some of those excuses as well. And God is saying to the people of Israel, listen, the reason why the temple is not uh, being done is because you have said in your hearts and you have said that the time is not here, the time has not come to build the house. But look now, this really, this really wasn't, excuses really wasn't the issue. It was something a little bit deeper, wasn't it? Because look what it says down in verse number um, 3. Look what it says. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lies waste? Wow. Do you, do you know what God is saying? The people were saying, Lord, it's not the time. It's not, it's not a good time. But that time had nothing to do with the problem. Do you know what the problem was? The problem was that they just didn't care. Because time really wasn't an issue at all because God says, man, you've dwelled in your sealed houses. Man, you've spent time building your own houses, but you've let the house of God go waste. And so the problem, my friends, wasn't that they didn't have the time. No, they had plenty of time. But you know what they had time to do? They had time to serve their own self-interest rather than sacrificing and doing the work of God. And so, my friends, what God is exposing here, God is exposing their hypocrisy through the prophet of Haggai, and God is putting His finger on the problem, and God is saying, no, it's not because time is an issue. The real reason why the house of God lieth waste, and the people of God are nowhere around the ministry of God and the work of God, but you're over here in your houses, and you're building your lives, and you're serving your self-interest. The reason for that is, is because you just don't, Care. You see, the problem was is that they didn't have energy. No, they had energy. They had energy to do what they wanted to do. The, the problem was is that they didn't have, it wasn't like they didn't have the ability. No, they had the ability. They knew how to build because they just built their own houses. But the problem was, it was a problem of priority. They put their own houses before the work of God. And God is saying, look, you have the time. You have the time to invest in your house. You have the time to invest in the things that you want to invest in. But where is your time for God? Now, church, let me ask you this question. I am not preaching against hobbies. I'm not. I'm not preaching against football games. Praise God, the Bills won today. God answers prayer. I'm not preaching against those things. I'm not preaching against vacation. I'm not preaching against leisure time, but I am preaching against forsaking the ministry and the work of God for those things. Man, there's a time to rest, isn't there? There's a time to sleep. There's a time to play, but there's also a time to work. Now, listen, anybody, and you, you all have known this since I have been the pastor, I have said that, look, when you come to join our church, that within one year of membership of our church, that you find a place to work, that you find a place to labor, that you find a place to serve, that you find a place to do more than just sit on a pew and take up space. 
I'm thankful for everybody that comes to our church. I'm thankful for that. And I, I love everybody that comes to our church. And I'm glad that you come to our church. And some of you, you just need to come and sit on a pew and hear the Word of God. But there has to be a time, there has to be a place when you graduate from just sitting on a pew to where you get your hands dirty and start working and start serving and start doing something tangible with your talents and your abilities and your treasures. Uh, listen, I, I, know, I don't know who ties what. I, have no, I know what I tithe. That's it. I don't look at the statements. I don't know who gives the missions or whatever the case might be. But I do know this, that, that we are to give to the work of God. We're to give to missionaries. And don't tell me that we can buy pizzas and we can go out to eat and we can go shopping and we can go to this place and go to that place and forsake financially the work of God that doesn't work, my friends. And there is no excuse that we can offer to God that is a justifiable excuse for us to forsake the priorities that are be in our lives. And so God begins to put the finger on the issue when He says, wait a second, I don't want to hear that the time is not here to build the house of God because last time I looked, God says to the people of Israel, you're living in sealed houses. He goes on to say, and the house lieth waste. And so I want to ask you, my friends, where do your priorities lie? You know, we have a lot of people who, who say amen about when somebody gets saved. And thank God we ought to rejoice. The Bible says there's joy in the presence of angels, which I believe it's God Himself who rejoices when people get saved. But look, we ought to be, we ought to be the ones who are involved in the work of seeing people saved. Amen? Now look at verse number 5. We're almost done. Because here, here's what happens. The, the people of Judah, the people of Israel, and when I say Judah and Israel, I'm, I'm speaking synonymously, okay? The people of Judah, they had an imbalance in their lives, right? They had given all this a time and all this attention to their own homes, to their own life, to their own things, to their own interests, and uh, all these things over here. And, and the work of God for 15 years, no one can be found. Well, well, look what happens in verse number 5. Notice what he says. He says this. He says, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. In other words, here, here's what God is saying. Look, give, give some thought to your ways. Take some time right now to examine your priorities. Uh, I believe if I remember right that this command is given no less than five times in the book. It's a plea on the part of God for the people to take note what, of what they are doing. Compare it with what they should be doing. Now look, right now I'm asking you just to kind of consider your ways. Evaluate your life. Look at your priorities and see where, where uh, of some things that need to be adjusted. Now notice in verse number 6, because as a result of this improper balance, notice what he says in verse number 6. You have sown much, bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. You see what God is saying here? God is saying, look, you've become a people. You're working harder and harder and, and you're trying to uh, uh, build up your possessions and build up your houses and gain more money and more food. And the harder you work, the less you're satisfied. And the more money you get, it seems like that money goes less and less uh, in, in providing for your needs. You're filling your plate with food, but you're not satisfied. You're drinking, but you're still thirsty. You're putting clothes upon yourself, but you're still cold. You're, you're, you're earning wages, and yet the, the bag that you keep those wages is full of, full of holes. You know what God is saying? God is saying that this is the condition of a people whose priorities are out of place. And I'll just kind of spiritualize this for just a moment. Do you know what happens for us as believers when our spiritual priorities get out of whack? You'll find that there's no deep 
satisfaction. They've just given themselves over to things rather than giving themselves over to the will of God. And I'm here to tell you that when we put our interest before the interest of God, you'll mark it down. You'll find that life will be very dull and unfulfilling. I know this two ways. Number one, because the Bible teaches that. But number two, because I've experienced that. And look at verse number nine for just a moment. He says this, you look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from the dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. God says as a result of, of you forsaking the spiritual and just living for the physical, living for your own needs, God says, I've, I've pulled away the dew from you. The earth has stayed from her fruit. God says, I've not blessed your vineyards. I've not blessed your crops. I've not given you rain uh, when needed. God says, I've removed my blessings from you. Look down in verse number 11. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of hands. Do you know what God says? God says, when you are not obedient, God removes the blessings. Here's the principle that we learn. The principle that we learn is simply this, is that there are blessings that are dependent upon our obedience. Listen, I, I can tell you this, as I said a moment ago, because the Bible teaches us that I can tell you from first-hand experiences that you will find that the blessings of God comes upon your life when you are obedient to the will of God and the work of God with your life. You mark it down. Listen, I have no... The church is not struggling. I'm, you know... Everything is fine, and I'm not trying to, I'm just using this as an illustration. You know, there might be some, I remember hearing this a long time ago where my pastor went to one of the men in the church, and he shared the story with me, and he said, you know, I had to approach him because he was a member, and he wasn't tithing. And I said, look, sir, you need to start tithing. And the man says, well, I'll pray about it. Can I tell you, there's not one person in here who's identified with this church who needs to pray about tithing a tenth of your income. I love how, how Brother Ron prays when he prays over the offering. Lord, you're so gracious to give us the 90, or, or to, uh, uh, to give us the 90, and you only require the 10. Thank you, God, for allowing us to keep so much of, of what you've blessed us with. And the truth of the matter is this, is that when we learn to obey God, there are blessings that are attached to the obedience of God's people to his word. That's exactly what Haggai is teaching. That is exactly what Haggai is saying to this people. For 15 years, you've forsaken the house of God. For 16, 15 years, you've run after your own thing. Do your own thing. Live for your own selfish desires and your own interests. And my house lieth waste. You have served no interest of my own, but only yourself seeking interest. And God says, the reason I have taken away your, my blessings, the reason I haven't given the ground its due, the reason I haven't given you the rain for your crops, the reason I've removed my blessings is because you've not been an obedient people. Now look, I do believe that sometimes God brings burdens into our lives to mature us and perfect us. But some of you might need to ask ourselves, and all of us need to ask ourselves, when, when, when the blessings of God are removed from our lives, Lord, is there something in my life that is lacking? Lord, is there something in my life that is wrong? Lord, is there a sin that maybe I turned a blind eye to? God, is there something that is dishonoring Your name? Lord, what is it about my life? Lord, show me, open up my heart, shine your word on the deep crevices of my heart because what God is establishing as a wonderful principle for us to live. And people say, well, the Old Testament's not relevant. No, it's relevant. It's good for us today. And the, and the principle that God is teaching is this, that God's blessings are attached to man's obedience. Now look at the plea. We're almost done. Look at verse number 8. Look at what God is saying. Notice the challenge. He says this, he says, verse 7, he says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now look what he says in verse number 8. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house 
I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, thus saying, saith the Lord. Do you know what God is saying? God is saying, look, right now, uh, uh, stop with your ways and get serious about God's business. It's time to start working. It's time to start building. Go to the uh, woods and get the wood. And notice what we read in verse number 12. The message that Haggai preached was effective. Why? Because the Bible says, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says that the people obeyed. This is what we read about in Ezra chapter 5 and verse number 1 through 2. Do you know what God is looking for? Uh, look, I'm here to tell you, God is not looking for any sensational Christians. How many of us are sensational? I think I'm pretty sensational. God's not looking for anybody who's spectacular. God's, God's not looking for anybody with great, unique abilities and talents and people who can impress others. No, that's not what God is looking for. Do you know what God wants? Do you know what God requires from us? Do you know what God wants from us? God wants simple obedience. God wants simple obedience. How, how many of you, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, I'm just asking for you to, you know, how many of you have a, a quiet time or a time throughout the day where you read God's Word? Most of us in here, we do. We, we read through the Bible. We, we have uh, uh, different sections that we're working on memorizing and so forth and so on. As we are confronted with God's Word, God's Word speaks to us. Do you all know what I mean by that when God's Word speaks to us? I'm not talking about with that audible voice, but I'm talking about that written Word. It cuts deep into the heart. And God's Word speaks to us. The Spirit of God speaks to us. And as we're confronted about our responsibilities and when we're confronted about what we need to be doing for God, do you know what God is looking for? God is looking for a response. God is looking for simple obedience. Now look, as we obey the Lord, when we're obedient, our priorities become what they need to be. God gives us a promise. Look down in verse number 13. He says this, Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the, uh, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Do you know what God gives us as we become an obedient people? He gives us a promise of encouragement. God says, I am with you. I don't know if I'm wording this right. I hope I can communicate this without causing any confusion. But we all understand the, the idea, the truth, the teaching that when we get saved, the Spirit of God lives within us, right? And so in a sense, we have the presence of God with us all the time. But in another sense, you remember when he told the disciples, and lo, I'm with you all, we even unto the end of the world, there's like a special power, a special strength, a special comfort, a special encouragement that comes with the presence of God when we are obedient to the Lord. You know what the Bible says in the New Testament? The Bible says that when God's people put God first, they'll find that they will have everything that they need. Anybody know what verse that is? Matthew chapter 6, verse what? 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Look at verse number 14 and 15. We'll close here. It says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. It took some time to gather the materials. They had to clear the debris. They had to pull away the weeds. But the day came when they started the work. Look, the day came when they got all the selfishness out and put all of the selflessness in. And I'm just wondering if that day will be tonight. I'm wondering if right now we would commit in our hearts, Lord, I don't know what's in my life that has been drawing and pulling my time. 
and my energy. You know, I was talking to my cousin Joe. My cousin Joe is a great soul winner and uh, loves the Lord and uh, anti-Calvinist, praise God. And Joe was telling me, he's like, you know, if you don't, without go, you don't have God. All you have is a D. He says, without go, you don't have gospel. All you have is spell. Without go, and he named a couple other things that I can't remember, but the point that he was trying to make, he's like, you know, people are going to get saved, but man, we got to go. And God will do something great, but man, we got to go. And the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes we think that we can just kind of sit around and expect God to do great things. No, we've got to do, use our hands and use our bodies and use our minds and use our mouths and use our abilities and our treasures and our talents to do something for God. I just want to ask us tonight, I want us to think about our own lives. Is there something that we've been neglecting? Is there something in our own lives that we've been putting ahead of God's work, God's word, God's will? Here we find for 15 years, the people of Judah, they said, man, the time, it's just not the time. God says, no, that's not the problem. The problem is you've had time to do everything and anything, but you've not focused on what needs to be focused on, and the house of the Lord lieth waste. And I just remind everybody that life is short. It's hard to believe I'll be 38 next month. I'm, an, I'm getting old, Miss India. I'm an old man. And I was young not long ago. And you all, some of you are in your 50s and 60s saying, man, you've got plenty of time. You're young, you're old. And that might be true, but I mean, just the blink of the eye, my hair is gone. I've got the dad bod. I got five kids growing. Life is just kind of just passing by. And um, I think of that verse where the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And the truth of the matter is, is that one day we're going to be, we're going to wake up and we're going to be old and our hunched over and our hearing's going to be gone and we can't see out of our eyes. And, and Brother Doug's saying amen to that. Yeah, we're going to look like Brother Doug one day. And we're going to wake up and say, there's plenty wrong with that, brother. One day we're going to wake up and we're going to say what Brother Doug says every morning. Where did the time go? I don't want to live life with regrets. I, I've only been a couple, uh, not a couple, maybe a half a dozen times. I've been in hospital beds and uh, hospital rooms with people who are getting ready to die. I, I've been with um, uh, two people as they died. Uh, one, one person as they died. No, two people as they died. And, um, and I've talked to a number of folks right before they were about to enter into glory. I've, I've never heard anybody say this. I've never heard anybody say, Boy, Pastor, I wish I would not have done as much for God as I did in my life. Never heard anybody say that. Never one time. And I don't think any Christian would ever say that. But I have heard people say comments similar to this statement. Boy, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. In other words, people have regrets. And I don't want to get to the end of my life where we have regrets. I don't want to get to the end of my life where we've looked and we have wasted years of our lives because we were so focused on our desires and our interests, just like the people of Judah. And God puts his finger on the problem and says, no. The problem was that you just didn't care. You just didn't care. So I hope that's not us tonight. I hope we'll get serious about the things of God. I hope we'll understand that all of us have value and purpose. We have abilities and talents, and we need to use those talents and those abilities and those treasures for the glory of God and for the work of His ministry and to do the Lord's will and seeing people saved and trying to influence folks and trying to tell as many people about salvation as possible. I hope we'll be involved in that.